everybody. My name is Jacek Bartoszak and welcome to Strategy in Future. And today my, my guest is Professor Everett Dahlman, uh, U.S. Air Force, Professor for U.S. Air Force, uh, a, a very well-known figure among uh, strategists dealing with space, outer space, I mean, and uh, the, the, the preeminent figure is uh, that some even compared to Mackinder or Spikeman in space or Clausewitz, and I'm saying it on purpose because really, the, if uh, and I recommend it if you read the book uh, of uh, by Everett Dolman, uh, Astropolitics, uh, you will be fascinating and taken into a journey into the space, and uh, I can't say anything more. I'll try to dive more into that during our conversation. Hello. Hello, yes, that's, that's very generous. Um, I'm happy to be here. I have to say that I am, uh, I am with the Air Force, uh, but I uh, am not speaking for the Air Force. These are my own opinions and my own uh, academic study that I am representing. Uh, we uh, have this conversation in August. It's uh, exactly uh, the 11th of August, 2020. And the dates uh, are important, not only generally important, but in the space exploration uh, important because many things are happening. Elon Musk is producing uh, uh, you know, samples of uh, prototypes of starships like uh, fresh bread uh, rolls. Uh, so let me start with this, you know, sort of uh, uh, with this subject. What would you change in your assessment from astropolitics that was written some time ago already, and the current situation uh, with the rising competition among, among spacefaring nations, this, uh, China and U.S., with some some role of Russia, and this uh, commercial activity, for example, of Elon Musk and his Starship man. What would you change in, in the outcomes and conclusions of your book? Well, a lot has changed. Uh, when I wrote this and I started, this percolated through, it was published in 2001, and my, my thinking about this began in, in the 1995 time frame um, because of a passion I have with geopolitics, classical geopolitics, and, and movements over time. But in 2000, 2001, the United States was in an unparalleled position of space dominance, uh, if you wish. Uh, we had uh, vastly more uh, infrastructure developed. We had a, a much more robust program, the Russian program, which had been the, the focus of uh, American military space activities uh, throughout the Cold War, had uh, fallen on relatively hard times. Um, the U.S. was even somewhat uh, propped up financially by paying for trips to various places and launches from uh, uh, as our own shuttle program was having some problems. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we were in a position of, of tremendous dominance. The Chinese had not emerged. They had started talking very uh, quite a bit about what they intended to do, but uh, uh, we're still very early in their commercial efforts. And commerce had not really taken off in space. The 1990s were a period when uh, communication satellites, for example, were, were, were were not being utilized as they could be as the new ideas of telecommunications through uh, fiber optics on the earth were, was taking off. But uh, the U.S. had realized with uh, its, its war operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield in Iraq in the early 90s that space was going to be the centerpiece of its uh, future power in the 21st century, that it would be uh, the force multiplier uh, that they were hoping for, and so was going forward apace. But until the mid-90s, uh, because of the Cold War and the realization that, um, you know, if any, if some uh, entrepreneurs were to be launching rockets from the U.S. or the Soviet Union, uh, then Russia, um, from, from an outsider perspective, it could look like an ICBM. And so private companies were not licensed to do the kinds of things that they've been allowed to do now. And that's a liability issue, anything that a company uh, chartered in, 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 a, in a state does, it is the state that is liable for the damages that they might cause. But we also had uh, a cadre of these folks who grew up fascinated by space uh, and had become billionaires through technology industries like an Elon Musk. 
and they wanted to leave a, a, a legacy for the world. They wanted to explore and they had the finances to do it at a time when belt tightening for space seemed uh, relatively important, especially after uh, the attacks of September 11, 2001 and the um, embarking on a war on terror. A lot of space programs got pushed back. That gave the opening for, for China to really push forward on this program and it has been uh, very robust. Uh, and with rising oil prices uh, and then falling oil prices, that tends to, that's a geopolitical consideration that tends to uh, have the uh, Russian space program reemerge. India is now becoming a big competitor. At any rate, space is uh, much more congested and contested, as our national strategy says, when it comes to, to uh, activities there. And the United States is no longer in sort of a safe mode where it could go ahead and contemplate doing some rather radical things in space uh, uh, with uh, the military and simply not have anyone oppose it. Uh, any, any of the, some of the, the possible scenarios that I, I outlined, especially chapter six of that book, uh, where the United States could at that time have seized low Earth orbit or control of low Earth orbit in outer space uh, with off the shelf technology. Um, would have been useful. But now that we have the, the tremendous influence of the commercial market and Musk's uh, efforts have been very, very successful, Chinese efforts as well. But Elon Musk is looking at uh, something like making, making space travel or space access as routine as air travel and access to many of us. He's, he's envisioning a thousand launches a year, perhaps a hundred a month, uh, and creating a, a massive new capability of getting to space, not just tourism, but development space. And uh, if that happens, and I'm behind them all the way, I'd like to see it. We could open up a neo-industrial age that would be green. Uh, pollutants, uh, we could do solar uh, power from space that would be non-polluting and basically free for all if we did it the right way. We could get rid of uh, waste on this planet, especially, first of all, nuclear waste and toxic waste. Actually, if we could elevate it and get it out into orbit and push it into the sun, we could get rid of it forever and, and, get, and clear that problem. And of course, the industry, productive manufacturing of, of lightweight, high value metals, et cetera, could be uh, produced out in space and very cleanly. So it, it, it looks like the future is, is hurtling towards us quickly. And it looks like it could be a very good, a very cooperative future, but it also looks like we are taking um, the national uh, programs out into space. Uh, nation states are not going away in the near term. Uh, we won't be creating a Star Trek Federation for some time, though. That would be a wonderful thing when it happens. And as we move out into space, we're going to find more areas of competition and more areas of conflict that could arise. Uh, so the other thing that is so fascinating about what he's doing is space is, is, is not controlled by nation states. It is unobtained. It is something that sovereignty can't be placed onto, like the, the oceans, the great oceans of the world, and like the American frontier uh, as the continent was settled. And wherever we have those great areas of, of, of uh, international uh, but non-sovereign space, uh, the military has, has been traditionally what goes in after commerce develops enough that we have a great value out of it. Uh, as the settlers in the American West went out into the, uh, into the uh, open areas, until they were trapping furs and producing products and farming and building, um, it was pretty much a wild uh, open area. But as that became more valuable to the economy, of the United States, the U.S. military, the U.S. cavalry went in to maintain law and order, to uh, help transportation, help commerce. And I can see that's the, the idea there is that uh, something that Dr. Brenziarni calls flag, called flag follows commerce. And as we start getting beyond for the United States, there's a 350 plus uh, billion dollar a year net value coming out of space. And as that's actually now surpassed avionics. Uh, as, a, as an industry for, for us, the things we get from space are seen more as infrastructure uh, with GPS and with uh, communications uh, that it needs to be protected, uh, protected from natural problems, protected from piracy, protected from uh, 
those who might want to try to take an advantage in space. So the military is going to be in space. It's going to increasingly be in space. And it would be like the U.S. Navy on the high seas in the kind of roles that it will do to include such things as search and rescue. Uh, Musk is, gets what he wants in, in tourism in space, and I think he very well will. Uh, what happens is if, if someone has to be rescued out there, it's the military that does those, those dangerous jobs and probably will in the future. But again, that means uh, it will be a zone of potential conflict. Yeah, it's of course it's very fascinating. Uh, uh, if if we judge the the the, the, the human record uh, in history, mm -hmm. uh, if uh, the, the competition, rising competition, moves people to a new domain, just like it was uh, around five hundred years ago in Europe, when we moved, we, mm -hmm. as I'm speaking from the perspective of the European country based in Poland, we moved mm -hmm. into the high ocean first through coastal uh, littoral waters uh, to the hazards that the you know the the, the world uh, the, the the great ocean revolution uh, brought and we created a new connectivity this is what you referred to by mm -hmm. making Absolutely. new transportation and new connectivity in time brings new economy uh, that changes the correlation of power and uh, it's completely a ruthless uh, principle that there must be an arbiter of the new connectivity mm -hmm. and the new economy. And who's going to be that arbiter, given the rising uh, rivalry between China and the United States, including the space, Luna, meaning you know, the moon, the cislunar space, mm -hmm. you name it. What do you think? What is your take on that? Well, you know, there's, there's some things that the Chinese are doing, and we, and we may get into it, that show that they really understand uh, the idea of global geopolitics of, of Mackinder and, and Spickman and uh, Mahan and others in that there are certain, uh, there are geographic bases to state power by the location that you are, et cetera. And one of the fat, uh, geopolitics stretches back 2,500 years. It's a, it's a long-standing, consistent body of theory. It changes with technology. And, and what I pointed out in my book was that as technology has made transportation move faster and farther, the earth has conceptually shrunk. Uh, you know, the, the Europe was its own world system 500 years ago, but with the opening up of the oceans now and the connectivity that comes of the whole world, uh, it also sort of shrunk our attitudes about how far away things were. When, uh, when air power comes in and we start going from Warsaw to New York in 10 or 15 hours instead of a month or two months. It conceptually changes that and those movements are something. So I, I, I had seen this body of marvelous heuristic value of thinking about uh, what, uh, what competition looks like with, with you know, a movement from land power to sea power, then to rail power, then to air power. And I found, I thought space must be its logical heir. And I wanted to see if those principles of geopolitics would apply in the 21st century in an era of space as they did 500 years ago with the opening of the ocean, as it did 100 years ago with the opening of the skies, uh, 200 years ago with railroads and, and Friedrich Liest and others like that saying how the world would change. Uh, Mackinder as well, that railroads could change. Uh, of the opening up of, of the great center of the Eurasian continent and how that would, uh, and how Poland would, the Eastern Europe would be the linchpin of power in that global view. Space, you know, we, space we think of as movement now in 90 minutes from entirely circling the earth and from a position in space, earth is now just a single port in a potential vast new ocean. And how that plays out, I think, is critical. But one of the reasons I did it, and one of the reasons I named my book Astropolitik uh, after uh, Realpolitik and the German School of Geopolitik was because as fruitful as this has been, it has also been perverted into a pseudoscience. It, was, it became the justification under Karl Haushofer in the 1930s to, uh, uh, for German Aryan expansion. Uh, and actually then even the superiority of the, the German race. It can be perverted very much. And I wanted to make sure that we don't ever forget that history. 
in the long line of history that we are going into space. But that was, uh, and, and actually after World War II, geopolitics almost disappeared from uh, American universities, as many Western universities, it became a, a bad thing even to study. In the 1990s, early 1980s, um, it had started returning from at the academic view because it is such a fruitful way of looking at great power competition over time. And I wanted to be part of reviving that. So I said, hey, if it works for space, then it's still valid today. And I think it does work very much for space, this principle. Yeah, it, 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 yeah it's, it's, it's very valid. And uh, I'm happy that you made this point. That strategy and future, we, we, we try to promote this way of thinking. Uh, and except, especially because we are on the continent mm -hmm. uh, where the history is made, on Terra, being Eurasia. Actually, Poland is Warsaw, it's halfway between Beijing and Washington, D.C. It's 200 kilometers closer to Beijing, and you can walk. And when we mm -hmm. think about, for example, the U.S. global posture, and I will touch the space soon, yeah, and when you take a perspective of Warsaw, then you see that the, American, uh, the, the U.S. needs to project power along the external lines of communication to Eurasia, especially Poland, mm -hmm. for example. While the Eurasian powers have the internal line of communication. So with technology, anti-access area denial, capabilities, and so on, it really creates more problems on, more stress on the U.S. power projection, the U.S. role in Eurasia. So I think that space, I wonder what you think about it, might be a shortcut to reverse this the wrong uh, equation because it creates the internal line of communication in line with what Jomini was writing for the United mm -hmm. States as a distant power projecting power into Eurasia through space in terms of the communication line, of course, also projectiles, but observation systems, you name it. And that this might be a leap forward by leapfrogging the current wrong correlation of, uh, of things. So I think I, I was thinking a few months ago when I read your book that the current tension and the potential showdown between US and China may propel United States and US Space Force into thinking in those terms just to leapfrog this problem and creating a new domain where it, it will be. What do you think about it? Is it well, you know, that's, that's um that's something I've been talking a lot about lately is, is domain theory in warfare. Um, and I've been, I think we need it in the United States to have a U.S. Space Force, even though it's, it's really a hollow thing at the moment. It's, it's been born with great expectations, but not particularly still trying to find its way. But that notion that space is potentially a warfighting domain that takes a different way of thinking about it, much like uh, an admiral is not likely to be a terrific ground commander and a general or an Air Force general probably shouldn't be commanding a, a fleet at sea. Uh, the, the way of thinking about space is quite different. And interior lines is, is part of that, that shrinking of the earth in many ways that happened when we when Mackinder was talking about how the railroad was going to change the relationship between Asia and Europe, because prior to that, the best way to go for the, between the two was to go around Africa or South America or through the man-made uh, uh, choke points in Gibraltar and Suez, uh, Panama, something like that. But with the railroad and the Trans-Siberian Railroad, of course a manifestation of that, was the idea that you could go uh, you could bypass that and the advantage of interior lines because of the new technology would start looking like the internal line advantage of classic uh, uh, strategic thinking and military warfare on the land. But Mackinder and Spickman also had this notion of the peripheral areas and the semi-peripheral areas and that history was this, this, this balance in maneuver between land and sea and for a while, C had that advantage because it could move from one side to the other faster than you could interiorly. So even though on the land, China has the advantage in, in uh, Eurasia, uh, being, as you say, you can walk there and you can rail there and you can fly and drive there. But from space, you get almost this new peripheral area, this new ability to move from place to place so quickly. Um, 
if you're going to have a, if you if you've got something that can go around the world every 90 minutes and now you put it into a network you have constant observation and potentially constant access to every point on the globe from space in just minutes it really reverses the uh, the the uh, logic of the advantage of interior lines to now the advantage of the exterior line the logic is kind of the same. It's about speed of movement and the ability to get force where you need it, here and then there. It was uh, uh, Germany's uh, advantage in World War I that it uh, had these great powers around it, but it could move from one part, one side to the other, taking each one on separately. Now you do that from space, uh, from an exterior position relative to the Earth. Exactly so, exactly so. This is fascinating, I wonder, uh, please tell me, do they really understand that in the space, the U.S. Space Force? And well, you know, I, I like to think that, that there's some people in the Space Force that have actually been reading a few of the things and have been learning about it and studying it. And I think they, that we have, we're very fortunate in that uh, many of the people in Space Force, and I'll be a little bit uh, self-serving here, have been my students who are now generals and colonels and leading the Space Force. And, and I have great faith in their ability to be, uh, to be leaders in this endeavor. Uh, space, though, I mean, one of the things about geopolitics, too, that's just fascinating to me is the difference between an authoritarian state and a more democratic state. And normally, it, it, uh, and you find that going all the way back to Thucydides, is that states that rely on maneuver technologies, uh, sea power when it is dominant, tend to be more democratic than states which rely heavily on ground power, on land armies. And that the answer is really very simple, it's because a land army can be uh, quickly turned from fighting a war to where the purpose of the military is to take and occupy territory, uh, a government can use the military if it is willing to do so to take and occupy its own territory. In other words, become a police force, whereas navies have never been particularly good at that. And while uh, space power will be able to project power onto the ground and actually will have tremendous surveillance capability, which you know is, is, a, is a precursor to police power, it really can't take and hold territory from space. And so the, the, the fortunate thing is that the space force that is going in, the American Space Force, is like all of the great maneuver powers from Athens to Britain uh, to the Dutch and to the U.S. tended to also be the most liberal uh, politically of their day. Uh, and so if the U.S. can get to space and protect our assets, protect our infrastructure there, and understand that space is the new high ground. It is that position because of gravity wells and because of uh, even directed energy projection through the atmosphere. You have such a tremendous kinetic and force multiplier, and we can talk about that a little bit if you wish, that from that position at the top of the gravity well in low Earth orbit, um, uh, you can determine whether or not uh, you can maintain a position, position of hegemony, if not empire. And, and uh, states that tend to be authoritarian tend to seek empire. States that tend to be hegemonic t tend, to, uh, uh, tend to want to do things like patrol the high seas for the good of all commerce and need to be able to shut down that access to opponents in time of war, but in times of peace to, to allow all commerce to happen. And they tend to be these liberal states, uh, and that bodes well for the future of outer space if we have a strong U.S. military presence in space to protect the new economy that will be in space. Uh, and while, while on a personal level, Americans and Chinese uh, like each other very much. We're very, very fascinated by Chinese culture. The Chinese are fascinated by American uh, technology. Uh, we get along together great. They're probably the strongest military potential, military ground power, uh, land power, army that the world has ever known. And the United States right now is the greatest maneuver power in sea and air uh, that the world has ever known. And so there's really, 
we can, the United States cannot occupy China successfully. China could not invade and occupy the United States successfully on the surface of it. You see, well, there's no real reason for conflict there except for economic conflict. But China is a rising power and the United States, the liberal uh, hegemony that it has, the United Nations, the, the world economy system that it has, if China were to become the most powerful state in the world, it would change that. And as Thucydides said, the reason that great wars are fought is because of the rising power of the new challenger to the dominant power and the fear that causes in the dominant power. And it looks like that's happening in China. And those wars can be pretty dreadful. Uh, whoever controls space, and China is very, very aware of this, they are, and they make no bones about saying we are going to space to control that critical position, which is low Earth orbit plus areas of uh, relative stability to the Earth, uh, the, L, the L positions, the Lagrange positions, and the moon. And are making no bones about this is what they're doing because China may not want to make an empire of the Earth. Traditionally, they're kind of like Spickman and, and Mackinder and the idea that there's the homeland, there's the periphery, and then there's everyone else. And, and, and uh, what they do know, though, is that if the United States can dominate space, um, there will be a threat to China always, and China will not be able to successfully expand out from the land base that they have. Uh, and the, but if they can prevent the United States from dominating space, there's nothing we can do to help them with, uh, to, to prevent them from expanding out into, say, Taiwan, or expanding out into Southeast Asia, or pressing their claims farther into the Eurasian continent in Africa. We would be, uh, our ability to project force beyond our borders would be completely neutered. So I have written in places that, uh, that a war with China, should it begin with the United States, will begin in outer space. And how far it goes from there is, is, is hard to say, but that will be the trigger point because it is, that is the critical location for the US to be able to project power and the Chinese to prevent us from projecting. Yeah, and of course we know that the Chinese uh, know that and are planning for that, mm -hmm. showing capabilities, demonstrating strategic signaling, through strategic signaling mm -hmm. that they are capable of doing some harm. You never know yeah. until it happens what sort of harm it, it is. And, and, and Russia, since, Russia seems to be doing it as well right now, uh, sort of flexing new muscles in space with capabilities with their satellites that look like a very sophisticated. Uh, anti-satellite, anti-space capabilities that are going on. Uh, just last month, uh, demonstrating a, uh, the, the ability to eject a projectile that looks like an anti-satellite weapon from a satellite in space. That's never been done. Oh, interesting. It's always been from Earth to space, yeah. I didn't know that. Plus, uh, I think Chinese reached even the, uh, the high orbits, not only the LEOs and, you know, the, the, yes. uh, as, which is, Quite a difference for those who don't understand the topography of space. It's quite a difference between that's, the an, a, that's an extraordinary achievement. Now, I think the United States is capable of doing it, but we haven't really demonstrated any test platforms or anything that would be dedicated to such a thing. The Chinese have not tested the system in geostationary, to my knowledge, but they certainly have tested uh, platforms that could do such things uh, as, as attack targets as far away as. 24,000 miles away from the surface of the Earth. Which is hell of a distance for the project. No, it's, it's really fascinating, too, from a perspective. You know, the United States landed uh, men on the moon, you know, in the late 1960s and 1970s. And we landed in some fairly benign territory on the facing side of the moon. Um, one of the things that has always been problematic is the far side of the moon is, is probably a much better place to have capabilities as it would be completely shielded from the earth yeah. uh, and but there's a communications problem uh, and so the Chinese have have done something absolutely brilliant they've they placed a communications repeater around the L2 Lagrange point so that if they do get something on the other side of the earth or uh, the other side of the moon or they can monitor the other side of the moon continuously because they can it's far enough out that it can relay back to earth at any given time they've also done something really really, in, in retrospect, just makes a lot of sense. Uh, 
the moon, because of the way it is, is is uh, not always uh, in in the it is, it, half of it is always in shadow. And so for half the time you're on the moon, and it's days and weeks at a time, you may not have access to solar energy. So what they've done is claim that they will be placing something at the south pole of the moon, which not only is where uh, a, a fair amount of ice is found that can be used as a propellant for future spacecraft and future expansion out into the, into the solar system, uh, there, it's fairly, it's got some high points there that you could put a base on the South Pole that would be high enough geographically that it would be in, in uh, it could access solar power 100% of the time uh, because of where it is on the pole. It's, uh, it's not going to be on the far side or the near side, the dark side or the light side. It'll be right there, right at the nadir of that constant. And it's a very, very, when you look at geogra geography as, as a basis for state power, a point on the earth that gives such an advantage, like the high point on a battlefield, that the dictum from Mackinder was, uh, if you identify those critical places, uh, you must either command those places or ensure that your opponent does not command those places. And that might too be a friction point as we look outwards towards the future potential for war started in, in space but it gives them a should they get their base set up and there's no reason to think that they won't uh and should they do uh seed low earth orbit and geostationary orbit these valuable places uh with which they expect and then also maybe start looking at basing at l4 and l5 a couple of the other lagrange points uh they would have a tremendous tremendous geographical advantages should competition, uh, conflict break out in space. Economic competition is good. Uh, military conflict, uh, uh, if the Chinese get where they want to be, would be a real uphill battle for the United States. Yeah, another fascinating point, uh, and I want to dive deeper into this lunar uh, battlefield, mm -hmm. but before we do it, let me get back to the you know to the coastal area of the space being the, yes. the, the orbits yeah. because it still seems that you can influence you can project power and deny space from Terra from Earth efficiently against the the assets on orbit meaning that China if, if it's effective I mean it's forced if it can still deny the U.S. the space assets to be used against the Terran um, uh, targets. What do what is your take on when when shall we? What is the correlation of forces and what is the trajectory in this competition yeah. between Terra and the the close coastal space? You you I remember you named it uh, in a peculiar way in your book. Uh, Terran space was that I, as far as I remember. But, yeah, Terran space was was that space that's really connected to the Earth gravitationally. And then trans, cislunar, translunar space, lunar space was out to the uh, orbit of the moon, slightly beyond. And then solar space was beyond the moon orbit. Uh, and I was doing that because I was trying to make analogies to uh, the heartland and to the rimlands and, and other uh, things like, and, and other areas like that, because I was trying to extend as closely as possible the global geopoliticians and others and take their views and see how they played out in space. And so much of that was an intellectual exercise to just see how far I could stretch the paradigm. But it makes a lot of sense. One of the, one of the differences I would do if I wrote that book today, uh, at the time, I argued that a valid system for sort of seizing control of space would be that projected by the Strategic Defense Initiative. It was undertaken in the 1980s and then actually maintained itself a little bit into the 90s, even under the Clinton administration. The Star Wars program, as it was called, was going to have uh, ultimately was just to start. How could we how could we defend from intercontinental ballistic missiles, which, uh, as you know, uh, go deep into space and in their ballistic trajectory from one side of the Earth to the other. And. The idea was if we could create a shield, a defensive shield, that that would change everything. It probably would have. Um, and Reagan even said we'd extend it out to the world. And I don't think he meant we'd give the technology or the capability to the world, but we could from space. Space is inherently global. That you can't think of space operations as above the US or above China. I mean, it is above the world. From that perspective, 
uh, no matter where you launch from on the world, it is effectively a single port from a perspective of outer space. It would be like uh, a great port like Danzig or, or New York. Uh, you have lots and lots of piers, lots and lots of docks, but you're still leaving from that general location. And so a blockade of that port uh, is, is, is easily understood. Low Earth orbit is how you would blockade anything from accessing outer space. You would have the military force there that if someone tried to go out, you could target it and attack it. Gravitationally, while that spacecraft, or, or in the case of the Chinese or Russian anti-satellites, these large rockets that launch from the Earth, they, they go quite slowly as they're starting to go up and then build up speed. From uh, space, you're already traveling at 17 and a half thousand miles per hour, and uh, to get to the, to the Earth is, is pretty quick. And so the concept for brilliant pebbles, brilliant eyes, what finally came out by the, late, uh, by the end of the decade, 1990, on how that would be, would be built, was a, a network of about 320, 350 satellites in low Earth orbit, each one of them with uh, 24, 25 small kinetic kill vehicles, just little rods with some propellant. Uh, traveling at that speed, they would have tremendous kinetic capacity. Though they couldn't penetrate the Earth, uh, penetrate the atmosphere of the Earth particularly well without completely melting and, and even dispersing. But because uh, a launch from a weapon in space creates a huge infrared plume from the, from the rocket engines, they're easy to spot. They're very easy to spot, very easy to target. And you could hit the, the missile coming up as it's coming up out of the atmosphere or early into its mid-course flight, which has the added advantage of it being destroyed over the launching country rather than being destroyed over the receiving country with the ground-based defense. And with those 350 satellites in low Earth orbit and another dozen or so higher up that would be uh, targeting satellites, it's what they were called brilliant aunt, um, the Bush administration decided to go ahead with, with doing technical tests on that because it was estimated you couldn't stop every missile. And that was the problem with the shield because at the time, the Russians and the United States had about 70,000 nuclear warheads between them. Even if you could stop 99%, that's still 700 nuclear warheads getting through. Uh, our best deterrent for a massive nuclear strike like that was a massive nuclear counter strike. But the real problem is, what is it we can't deter? We can't deter uh, a rogue nation launch, someone who's just insane who has control over a button, um, uh, maybe a non-state actor who gets control of a missile capability. The, uh, the rogue boat captain or the, the mad Air Force general in Dr. Strangelove. But the real fear was that a third party war where two, two nation states or one nation states might lob a nuclear missile at another one that would drag the great powers in. What if India and Pakistan engaged in some sort of a nuclear exchange? What if Israel launched a nuclear weapon at Iran or vice versa should it get a nuclear weapon? Um, this, how, you know, that's the real danger. And so this system, uh, network system, it was estimated, could engage 100 missile launches anywhere on the Earth simultaneously with a high degree of effectiveness. So a single launch, a small launch, a couple of launches would have an almost 100% chance of engaging it before it reached a high altitude. And I like that idea because it was going to be very, very, very expensive. But it would be very expensive each time you used one of the weapons. And so it would be for high value fleeting targets, not for mass war or anything like that. And I, I discounted directed energy weapons, lasers, uh, plasma, microwave, that kind of thing in space uh, as being also very expensive. But if you could have a, a electrical powered laser and you could use a small nuclear reactor like we use on our deep space probes uh, to generate that electricity. Every time you used it, you half the cost. Uh, the more you use it, the less expensive it comes. And I, and I just was worried about that. Since then, however, I've realized that uh, there's been, well, there's been tremendous advances in laser technology. And just like you get a tremendous kinetic advantage, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, 
my friend, Dr. Michael Smith has explained the physics to me. You know, if you were to take a high powered hunting rifle and shoot at the moon from the earth, you know, you're just not going to get there. You're not going to get a, not even going to get more than a couple of miles above the earth because of gravity. But if you took that same rifle on the moon and shot at the earth, it would, you know, the bullet would go that far. It would burn up in the atmosphere. But if you aimed right and you aimed where it was going to be, as just as you do if you're duck hunting or something, you aim in front of your target, uh, it would go that far. It's that big of a difference in capabilities. So you need a much smaller weapon to counter anything launched from the Earth. Well, what about lasers from the Earth? Great big lasers that have been built both by China and by Russia, smaller ones by the United States that are capable of reaching out and touching the satellite. Well, we have sort of the same problem. It's called the shower curtain problem. Uh, a laser launched through the atmosphere starts to disperse. And since you're launching from, or you're firing from the earth, from the earth, it disperses out and then cones out towards the target. So it takes a tremendous amount of power to have an effect on a satellite. The satellite, however, going the other way, the, the energy is very concentrated until it gets towards the Earth and hits the atmosphere and then disperses up. So you need at least 10 times as much uh, power from directed energy going out of the Earth as you do going into the Earth to get the same effect. Now put that all together and um, you can also, there's also the fact that, that directed energy is 100% additive. That means you don't need a million kilowatt laser to burn through some massive capability, you could have a thousand 10 kilowatt lasers all targeting the same point. And then you get a mil million kilowatts on that point. Now in space, let's say you have a thousand lasers in low Earth orbit and they're small 15 kilowatt lasers. By the way, going through a vacuum, they could probably do to some, each one could probably do significant damage to a satellite without blowing it up and creating debris. Uh, and you could destroy, you could degrade solar panels, you could blind the satellite very easily, but you'd have no effect on the Earth. They'd be very safe for those of us living here if they were ever used. Plus, they could start taking debris, small debris, out of space. So, uh, what you would do is you would simply paint your target, and any 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 laser in range would 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 fire at that. And where they intersect, you would have enough power to make the destruction. Capability, so it's actually very cheap, and we do this now. We send lots. We, we're putting small satellites in large networks to get the same capability that we have from a very expensive single satellite, but we get a global coverage, and it's also considered to be more resilient against damage from natural and caused. Well, all this is immaterial if you don't have the will to use it. You have to be able to say, look, if somebody's launching a strike at weapons in space or satellites in space. The only way you can really defend from that would be in space at those weapons before they get out of the atmosphere. If you're willing to do that, and that means if someone builds a great space laser and they're obviously pointed up and they're obviously there to, 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 to challenge space, you have to be willing to destroy it before they fire. It's a, uh, the idea that some people have said it's very easy to attack space because you orbits are fixed and you know where they're going. and where there'll be, it's not easy to find things from the earth and space because of the atmosphere that can maneuver and the kinetic and distance and speed advantages you get from that if you're willing to use it. And that's the real limiter. Even 20 years ago when I wrote this, I said the United States would not be willing to demand of everyone on the earth that you can go into space to develop commerce as much as you like, but we have to inspect your payload. If it has a weapon, we're not gonna let you launch it, or if you do launch it, we'll blow it up. Uh, I didn't think we had the political will to do something like that, to become the space cop for the world. Uh, as tensions rise, um, maybe we would, but China might very well be willing to do such a thing, to say, okay, we've, we've seeded space with weapons, and unless you play by our rules, uh, we're not gonna let you get in. And uh, that, that, that's, that's worrisome. It's one of those things, uh, one of those things that with human nature and history as our guide uh, as to what tends to happen, uh, just because it's always happened doesn't mean it will, and just because it's never happened doesn't mean it's, it won't. But if you go to Las Vegas, you probably should bet that way. Lay it on yeah. the table. So there's a lot of technical things about space war that um, 
you can only think of if you are a space professional thinking from a military mindset. Now, the military of the United States Navy is, is its primary mission in peacetime is to protect commerce. I believe the Space Force will have the same primary mission to protect commerce. Uh, but when war comes, you have to have the advantage in that because you've got to deny access to that to your opponent. And, and that actually makes commerce safer. You know, it's, it's because the United States Navy is on the high seas that if I send my, my ship from, from the Persian Gulf or the Iranian Gulf to uh, uh, the Arabian Gulf, depending on who you, which, which direction you want to go with that, and you're going to try to get it uh, to, say, Singapore, uh, that it's because there is a Navy that protects from piracy, that clears blockades, that that uh, opens up international seaways when they're challenged, that provides weather data and navigation data, that you're very much more likely to get there. And so uh, the more powerful a military is to ensure safe commerce, the more reliable commerce is and the more it grows. The military is only, a, only shuts down Congress when the war actually happens, uh, commerce when the war actually happens, but then we've got uh, bigger problems when that goes and commerce gets nationalized and becomes part of the war effort. But for the most part, the British Navy, the Dutch Navy before it, the U.S. Navy now are the dominant players uh, on the world's oceans, and they, and they uh, enforce international norms in the world's oceans and protect commerce. I would expect nothing less of space. But you need space as a domain, a way of thinking. Uh, we have an air domain, so you have an air force assigned to it. We have a sea domain, so you have a, uh, uh, a navy assigned to it, a land domain. And, and part of the reason is, uh, to use an air power analogy, uh, no ground commander, no army commander is going to see command of air as job one. But the Air Force knows that if it can't get command of the air, if it can't get aircraft into the air and operate them there, it can do nothing from the air. It can't deliver bombs or humanitarian aid or transportation of people and goods. It simply can't do that. It can't do surveillance. It can't do any of the jobs. It can't get any of the effects you have from space. Very much like a geopolitical dictum, if you can't control the area, uh, don't let your opponent control it, but you can't use the area. You may be able to bomb from the air, you may be able to bomb from space so effectively that nobody can be on the ground from the air and from space. You can't grow crops, you can't, uh, you know, you can't search for, you can't help others who might be there, you can't do humanitarian missions, you can't run factories. Uh, you have to be on the land to do that. You have to be in the air to be able to understand how the mission interacts with all the others. You have to be in space to understand how that mission reacts. Now, historically, for the US, I realize I'm going on very long. I hope it's, I hope it's not, uh, uh, rambling too much. But in the United States, because we were so far ahead for so long, we started thinking that we're just going to have space, no matter what. Nobody's going to challenge us there, so we'll have space. So we rebuilt our military forces on the ground, in the air, and at sea to rely heavily on space, so heavily that they almost today can't operate without space. But because then space became such an important target for someone who doesn't use space as much. If you want to take out space, you take out America's ability to project power overseas. It becomes a, a lucrative potential target. And yet we've done nothing to protect it. We just try to deter. We say, well, we'll attack you somewhere else. Um, and that became problematic because once we realized how reliant we were on space, our military folks said, hey, we have to recognize we might not have it in war, so we have to practice to be able to fight without space. And if we can fight without space, what do we need the expense of space for? Why do you have to do both? And, and this mindset came up that in the future war, space will be degraded and might not be available, and you have to be able to fight through that. Well, a few space professionals started saying, hey, you know, that the air is going to be degraded. You know, you might not get the air support you want. The, sea, the ships will be sunk. Why do, we, why do we not have the attitude that we're going to fight to get as much support from those domains as possible? And they started saying, hey, we, I, I can't guarantee that you'll have 100% of all the space you ever want. But I'm going to, if I'm in charge of space, I'm going to fight to make sure you have as much space as possible. And I am going to fight through all of that. And I'm going to find ways to make sure you get your space support and your space capabilities 
in a combat environment. Until you have that idea, that notion, that belief, that, that idea that space command and space control is job one, or we get nothing from it, we were degrading terribly our ability to defend and even fight or even think about fighting in space. We just started assuming we wouldn't have it. The new Space Force, by declaring this a war fighting domain, is sort of challenging the rest of the world. It's sort of saying, hey, we're going to do some things here that you might find frightening. And, and But what we're really saying is we're going to do, we're going to try to guarantee that we will have space available when you need it. Maybe not as much as you want, but we will make sure that we can deliver those effects that we rely on so much. And it's not just military effects. Uh, GPS, for example, it's the timing signal in GPS that allows for the encryption that allows for us to have uh, secure transactions on the internet. And therefore, I can buy something and I'm pretty sure that my credit card won't be stolen. There will be just about the right amount of, of money when I, I purchase it. I track it because of space. Uh, there are certain businesses like Uber and Lyft that couldn't exist without GPS to help in their model, their business models. We have just-in-time supply, which is a way of production that is entirely based on space capabilities. Even our cell phones, which we rely on so heavily, and they transfer through cell towers. Those cell towers are switched and, and commanded and controlled by space uh, capabilities. Uh, our electric power grids, when you have to shift uh, through the transformers, is quite often connected to space capabilities. If if space were to be lost to us, even military space, because GPS is an Air Force program paid for by the Air Force completely, 100% entirely, our economy would crash. The world economy would take a tremendous blow. Uh, people would suffer, people would die. Uh, protecting that, we start thinking of it as vital infrastructure when we have a space force to think about space as job one. So I'm glad to see it. I think uh, any major power with space and military and a need to protect that should, put, put, should probably think about a space force. Just because we don't go to war because uh, Russia has a Navy or China has an Air Force. We go to war for political reasons and for uh, others, and these are just tools that we use. But within the military, thinking about joint warfare, thinking about war, multi-domain warfare, warfare to protect the state and to protect the allies and commerce and, and innocence, uh, we have to have that war fighting mentality. The purpose of the military is not to fight, it's to be prepared to fight and if needed to be available. And that is what deters wars. Not just saying, hey, I'm not gonna do anything about it, we might you know, lose something. Yeah, I, 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 you know, in line with what you were saying, um, mm -hmm. uh, I, it is fascinating uh, to me how uh, still it is the earth and the land where people live. They interact, they make money, and there is always a power politics and correlation of forces. And historically, other domains have just been enablers. Uh, yep. More important or less important, different in well, nature, different in nature like sea or yeah. air. And now space. And if from a from a land perspective, I I think that can be very true. Uh, it is where we live. But if you are geographically sort of lucky enough to be like Britain, for example, an island, a navy is your first line of defense. And if you have a navy, a strong navy, a powerful navy, you really don't need much of an army at all. Uh, now, okay. Poland is surrounded by potential great powers, and it needs an army. There's nothing one can do about that. That's the situation that is, that is created by geography. China has got the Russia to the north and India to the south and Europe to the west. But the United States is very, very uh, fortunate. It has an ocean between it and all the great powers. Uh, so geography determines what kind of military force you need. If the United States is, is going to project power around the globe, then it needs to be a very, very powerful presence in space. Trump. It needs, if it's going to protect the homeland, the, the, the land where Americans live, it also needs a very defend, protective defensive uh, capability in space because any damage to, to uh, 
Uh, the people who live in America will come through space, whether it's from ballistic missiles or from uh, uh, space-based weapons, because our Air Force probably can defend from other air, our Navy can defend another Navy from coming and bringing land forces directly against us. Uh, so a lot of that is, is, a, is a geographic perspective uh, that comes. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to be so quick to say, you know, that, that all these other domains are supporting the ground domain. Uh, and once you get onto space, and as, as, as I, I know you've talked about that perspective, the Earth is just another place. It's just a place over there. Um, uh, now, from the human perspective, it is, it is where everyone lives. You, don't, you haven't yet colonized other planets or the moon or anything like that. What, what, what I wanted to underline, let me, let me just clarify, was that uh, there are many domains that interact, okay, creating a correlation of power on yeah. Terra, on Earth. And space, the orbits which are close to Terra are also influenced by Terra and the other way around. So uh -huh. we are still within the geopolitics, so to speak, even yeah. if it's a little bit extraterrestrial, but it's yeah. still within yeah. geopolitics. And uh, you know, and we will be for some time. time. Yeah, and we have the model uh, because we we deal with forecasting strategy mm -hmm. in the future. We have the model based on the concept of strategic flows. Strategic flows being deployment of troops, power projection, access to allies, to resources, material, oil, you know, and so on. But also movement of people, cargo, goods, technology, knowledge, data, and so on. And they traverse via physical geographical locations. Mm -hmm. Just as you were saying about Suez or Ibla. Mm -hmm. And the last 500 years is the domain of the world ocean where that is dominating the strategic flow because you make money if you Absolutely. control the world ocean. And I think if you, if, if you control the space, the orbits, you control the world ocean. And if you control the world ocean, you control Eurasia. And if you control the world ocean and Eurasia, you control the Earth. And my question mm -hmm. is, when sh shall we transcend it? Because we will move the military domain from the uh, orbits of the Earth to the outer space uh, par excellence, which means that we will have the assets, space fighting assets, independent from Terra control and command in some bases there on Luna or in the, you know, this space be controlled there, piloted there. When do you expect this to happen, this break breakout point? Yeah, Pro well, not, not while I'm still writing, uh, probably. <laughs> it's not that far out in the future. Uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting a little long in the tooth here. I, I think, though, that one of the geopolitical considerations that's going to be fascinating for the future is the cyber domain. Because the cyber domain is entirely virtual. And so when we talk about data, as you did, and information, and information critically becoming the coin of the realm, uh, how that moves through cyberspace to the virtual space, and which is, is in many ways a social construct of money today is, is just sort of what we believe that it is. It's just data. It's ones and zeros in bank accounts. Um, the movement of data and the destruction of data is a type of violence that we see. And so in the, 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 to get back to this question that you have is when we think of, of the geopolitical ramifications of movement and mass uh, from a space perspective, and, and as long as we're still within the lunar space, we are still highly geocentric, uh, Earth-centric. Um, a human in space to fight wars, to transport goods, uh, is, is really too expensive to, to do at scale. Keeping people alive in outer space for any period of time is, is, is very, very expensive. And so what we do is all of it is, is like, um, like uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, which uh, unpiloted vehicles, robotics, all of, all of the, the sort of near-term future of movement because of the timelines. It takes, you know, we, we, we can simply have a very small vehicle
doing certain things that if you put a human being on it would be too expensive. The space shuttle program basically had its demise because of that. It's just vastly too expensive to send humans up with a payload just for the person, for, uh, for reason of getting the payloads in. So the United States Air Force now has, has a tremendous asset that it took from NASA because NASA didn't want to fund it. And it's about a quarter scale uh, space shuttle. It's called the X-37B. It's, a, it's, a, 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 it's launched on top of a rocket, but it comes back and lands on an airstrip and it can stay up in space for, for long, a long time, years, conducting experiments, moving around, maneuvering, bringing cargo, getting things, bringing it back. Um, and it's not, it's not piloted. There's no human beings on it. It's completely remotely piloted, like, like predator aircraft, the things were getting very common. Uh, robotic movement on the moon. Once we get out beyond out to Mars, out to the asteroid belt, uh, where the communication lag is hours potentially between getting a message out and then getting it back and then back, get back again. We're talking about hours. We're going to need human beings on the scene again. And so the moon is really our practice for having human colonies farther out into the solar system, all the way out to the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, where we think there might be tremendous uh, resources. Uh, and there will have to be humans on the scene. And we're going to start looking again now at that great expanse and analogizing from uh, the Earth experience in the oceans, et cetera. But, but right now, um, for the near term, we're going to be conducting all of our space operations, much of the space operation, and the movement of data will become as important as the movement of physical goods. And right now, that does move uh, through, the, through the virtual space. And the virtual space moves through uh, outer space satellites and communications, et cetera, and encryption. Um, and we're going to have to start thinking about geopolitics in the virtual realm of cy cyberspace. What are the analogies? How that works again? And I think that's going to change a lot of views as we move out in just time itself because of the speed of light. Uh, creates an expanded where the, the whole earth then just becomes a single point in the conception of geopolitics. Now that's 50 to 100 years at current rates, uh, at best. Um, but the moon is really a practice for us, a, a way of gaining experience in how to do that. It's also because of gravity wells, our launching point to go farther out. Even if we put weapons on the moon, uh, say to, to, to target the Earth or to target other satellites, the distance is long enough that if they're kinetic, if they're physical, it can take days to get to your target. You have to know where your target's going to be 24, uh, you know, 24 hours from now. Uh, lasers would be a different story. Directed energy would be a different story, traveling at the speed of light. So we'll be looking more and more at that kinds of things. And distances, you know, it's 90 minutes to get around the Earth with a physical satellite. It's uh, nine seconds to get from, from the moon at the speed of light or less. Um, and the attenuation through vacuum is going to change things. So geopolitics will still be the model, I think, that extends out into that brave new universe. But we're going to have to think about it a little bit differently. We're going to, have to think about it in, in, as we do with space, instead of elevation, but in gravity wells. In, in gravity is really creating, you know, the conduits of trade, uh, home and transfer orbits. The, the way you go from one orbit to the other without using too much fuel is a, is a roundabout way. But it is going to become just like the great sailing routes uh, of the oceans, the the, the 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 railroads being placed down that cause lines of communication, those are going to develop. There'll be points out there, choke points, decisive points that we think about areas of control because economics is the sinews of war. And for Alfred Mackinder, uh, and for him, Alfred Thayer Mahan, the, the Admiral, you don't have to control all of the oceans. That's even impossible. But if you control the seven choke, great choke points of the earth, everybody else has to they you tax to get through them, or they have to sail the right a long way around, which costs them more. And over time, you'll get that economic advantage that builds you up into a great power. So we just have to think about space and the relationship with us on the land uh, in three dimensions, and now in four dimensions with cyber, uh, and see how it plays out. And I think we'll be 
pretty, if we're grounded in classic geopolitics, we'll, we'll do very well. So who will seize first uh, liberation points that are essential to control the, you know, the Luna well, and Terra system? Yeah, I, well, industry is, is the best use of the uh, L4 and L5, the most stable libation, liberation points uh, that are out there. Uh, and really, it's not a point as much as a, you know, a, it's a gravity anomaly where you'd be in an orbit by the, way, by the way, how big is that? How many spaceships can be housed there? You know? Well, that's, that's the great thing. Um, because, it's, because you basically are in a little orbit in that space, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of a, a, a hole that you can sort of sit in if you want to envision a two-dimensional uh, uh, map, uh, uh, where you just, you just are sort of there without expending energy to maintain yourself. Now, there's always perturbations and, and things that happen, but the... Uh, the the um, the Chinese vessel at L2 right now is in a fairly large orbit around L2, so that it, it is always able to see around the moon. Uh, literally, it's a huge, huge place, and if the spacecraft are normal size that we have today, you know, millions can fit uh, theoretically without ever having to really, uh, if you do it just right, without ever having to uh, spend any fuel to yes. keep from hitting each other. The, 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 the thing we'd be looking at at L4 and L5 would be for big staging bases to be able to take off, say, to Mars or to the uh, uh, great resources that would be in the asteroid belt, but we wouldn't have to fight gravity to get there. We could use a fraction of the fuel that we use to get from uh, the moon and even in a much greater fraction from the Earth. That, that, you know, when we launch something in, into space from the Earth, 90% of the of the thrust of those rockets goes to just getting out of the atmosphere. This is uh, why this is why Elon Musk wants to refuel well in orbit. Well, yes. That would be a, you know and and you could uh, if we because fuel you know water hydrogen is 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 a great uh, rocket is a great space fuel and you could just sort of start putting uh, you could make tankers and and fuel depots and just set them there much like the old fuel depots of. Uh, Frederican and Napoleonic warfare, where you had to have them all stationed around to get from here there, or the coaling stations when steam oh, power hit the uh, hit the oceans. It's, it's the the, an the analogy is that, but also you could say uh, hurl mass from the moon into those, capture them at those places, and then start you know, uh, using the whatever minerals and ores and possibly uh, exotic uh, ones uh, to start manufacturing there. So you would have uh, collection facilities, relay facilities, manufacturing facilities, and it would actually be a staging port for, for human travel in the long distance to get out into the atmosphere. So it's a tremendously valuable place, but, but it's, you know, it's, it's it, let's just say it's, uh, you know, 200 miles across, but it's also 200 miles deep. It's in three dimensions, and you could put all kinds of things in there. You could put thousands of U.S. of international space stations in there. So. These are valuable places. These are these are places that will be uh, out there, and and uh, if uh, you put some large solar panel arrays with very thin microfilms of solar panels to collect energy, all the energy you would want. Uh, you know the amount of of solar energy that reaches the Earth in just a few seconds. If we could harness a hundred percent of it, would would energize everything we need. We need we we use electricity for in just a few seconds for an entire year, if we could harness that efficiently enough. So if you're in a spot where you have uh, solar energy coming in, and just with our technology today in solar panels, we, uh, we would have a tremendous amount of power. And if you had a nuclear reactor in space far enough away that it would never you know, come into the earth, you've got no, no problem with uh, heat sink. You don't, you, know, you don't have to cool it. The, the, the vacuum's a fine coolant. You don't have to worry about it at all in that sense. So, we'll, so there's all kinds of power capabilities that can be developed in space. And those are, those are useful because you don't have to expend energy to move. Right now, and I, I detail this in my book, you know, uh, power in space is a uh, dollar in space. It's all delta V. It's all the ability to change and move in space. And it's all uh, fuel. Fuel is very expensive to get into outer space from the Earth. Uh, if we could get um, literally free fuel or fuel without uh, having to propel it first into space, um, we might have constant propulsion and that would change everything. That would just change everything. We could do all kinds of different things. 
right now we have to use orbits uh, in, in precise knowledge of orbits using the gravities of various uh, the moon and various other places to sw swing us around uh, for speed and for efficiencies. But uh, free abundant energy from solar or really efficient solar or from uh, just being able to go to the moon and hurl, you know, hurl some mass out into space, catch it, and then go from there and use it as fuel. Well, who knows? That's a, that's a so, so, so you mean we would we, we could abandon the Hochmann's transfers here yeah, and just move as we wish? We could. Yeah? We could. And uh, um, that would, uh, you know, and be if fuel were not a concern, yeah, we could just burn as fast as we, because, they, you know, when you go in space, you have to, you have to get, you just get a certain amount of momentum to get to a place and with fuel, but then you have to stop yourself. So at the halfway point of wherever you're going right now, you have to turn around and, and have the rockets decelerate you. Uh, but, and it's a very expensive proposition. And it's also time consuming. So you have to be careful that you only go so fast that you'll be able to stop yourself in time. But with that, you could just simply do a very large, powerful burn more when you get close to where you're going. And that's the other reason why humans are problematic in space is because the G-forces that come from rockets just you know, turn us into jelly at some certain point. But if you've got an unpiloted vehicle, it can maneuver much more rapidly and take forces that human beings in space simply couldn't. So piloted vehicles, robotic vehicles right now are gonna be the better fighting machines. So what of uh, the technological breakthrough are you expecting in terms of propulsion in uh, our lifetimes? Uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, yeah, the one that, that looks like it's, you know, uh, potential would be an electrical propulsion system that uses uh, electrical ionization to propel you because uh, we can generate electricity from solar power uh, pretty well. We can also generate electricity from fuel cells, but mostly from also nuclear power in space. That seems to be the one that could get us there. But I'm, I'm a theorist, you know, and, and theory is lovely because it's in this closed world model that you make, and the real world is just so much messier than that. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, making predictions is, is, is always going to kill your, your reputation as a good theorist because they'll never be quite right. And something that you couldn't have possibly seen will come up. And uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb, I believe, is what called it, uh, uh, talking about you know the end of history thesis. You know, is is ideology X or something? I call it technology X. Technology X will happen, and it happens uh, uh, with a, a frequency that is plottable and is accelerating. Uh, what technology X is, I don't need, but technology X is going to come along within the next 10 years that is going to change a lot of the way we think. And in the next 50 years, a complete revolution in military affairs technology will, will likely appear. Uh, that will, will change all of our concepts about how we have to do. We have to be prepared. And that's the history of geopolitics, classic geopolitics, especially uh, since uh, uh, some of the great theorists of the last 200 years is that technology changes the shape of geography around us. Um, even in power points, you know, 200 years ago in Poland, if you had a lot of oil on your land, it would probably not be worth too much because it wouldn't, you know, crops would not grow very well. And, and uh, you know, it, was, it would be really more of a nuisance. But uh, today, uh, oil, you know, is, is, is having vast reserves of oil is, is, is a basis for state power. A hundred years from now, it won't. Uh, oil will, will probably never be used because it will get so expensive the rarer it gets, but uh, it won't be a basis for state power. It creates too much pollutants, et cetera, but right now it is, and something else will be. And what that is, I don't know. You know, We look at uh, rare earth minerals and metals now for cell phones and things like that, and how important that is to the world economy. That's something we just wouldn't have thought of. So what the technology is, I don't know. The uh, one of the things that's been projected for a couple of decades now is the possibility of something called helium-3 on the moon in large amounts uh, that could create and generate a tremendous amount of power. And I'm not sure of the physics on that, but that could potentially be harnessed if in fact, harnessed if in fact it's there in great amounts. Yeah. The amount of water that's on the moon seems to keep growing every time we look for it. Uh, and water as a propellant is, is a terrific. Uh, you know, space, you just, it's, it's just a matter of rocketry uh, yeah. to, to move. So I don't know what the technology will be, but I know the technology is going to challenge us. 
but it doesn't, uh, you know, it's, uh, there are these immutable principles of mass, maneuver, speed, uh, that, that we can apply throughout the generations and technological changes, and we have to be ready to do that and accept and understand it quickly. I think the Chinese are, are adapting geopolitical principles faster right now than the United States is, and that worries me. Not because I think the Chinese are evil or nefarious, but because traditionally changes in power cause wars. Uh, not only the growth of power, but the fear that causes in those who are not growing so fast or who are declining. And, and so uh, it is a worry. And maybe that's a good moment to wrap up. And I promise. Well, uh, I could go on for more for hours if you like. Uh, I'm sure you could too. <laughs> and, and and this is how I'm I'm going to to convince yeah. you. Hope to convince you to 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 record another video. Uh, I I think that uh, our audience will be pressing me hard to to convince you to really do it. So I need. Well, to... I'd be happy to. This is this is a great joy for me, and I'm very interested in in your own positions, which are powerful, and and, uh, and I have just recently been interested in transferista. Yeah, thank you very I mean, much. I, 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 unfortunately, I don't know Polish, uh, but uh, as you're translating things, I will be reading them. Okay, thank you very much. The, this was a fascinating discussion. I'm, I'm completely hungry for more. I haven't, I am not fed up, I'm not full. Uh, I, I've had like 2,000 questions uh, to ask, but it was so fascinating to listen and keep, keep you know, let you keep talking. And, well, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I, I really promise that we will, we will repeat it, so to speak, okay, and we'll have another chance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our guest was Professor Everett Dolman. Uh, stay tuned to Strategy in Future. Thank you, Professor.